Thank you. Well, thank you all very much for coming tonight. Um, I hope you're ready for your science lesson. I, my goal is to tell you a little bit about why we keep sending spacecraft back to Mars. What is it that's so interesting about Mars? And then to share with you some of the things that we've discovered as the Curiosity rover has been there for seven years. Is there any way to turn the lights that are on the screen? Can we dim those? Because the pretty pictures won't show up. Is it just those that show up? Oh, there we go. You could. So now we got the floodlights off. Thank you. So. As you go out and gaze at the night sky, you see thousands and thousands of stars. And people will look up at the night sky. And for, for centuries, we've wondered, are we alone? Is anyone else out there? There's always this quest. So we start looking. And one of the places that we've been looking to answer this question is, is, is Mars. So why do we go to Mars and what is it? Well, if we're going to look, and there's thousands and of stars that you can see, millions and billions of stars within every galaxy, we got to narrow our search a little bit. So we need to know what we're looking for. So if we're going to look for signs of life, we need to know what life needs. Life basically needs three primary things. One, the right chemicals, the carbon, the hydrogen, the oxygen, the sulfur, everything that makes us up. Living organisms have DNA and RNA, and you've got to have all the right chemicals for that. Every living organism needs an energy source. We get ours by eating food. Plants get theirs from the sun. There are different ways. There's even some organisms like deep in the bottom of the ocean that get their energy from hydrothermal vents. And so anytime there's an energy source, that helps keep the cells organized. If you don't have your energy source, the cells kind of break apart, fall, fall apart, and things die. Living organisms also need some kind of liquid to transport the chemicals in and out of the cell. Life on Earth, that liquid is water. There are some people and some Folks who think, well, maybe it could be some other kind of liquid, but water has a lot of advantages. And so we kind of narrow our search looking for places that have those three things, the right chemicals, some kind of energy source, and liquid water. The right chemicals are pretty easy to find. They're pretty much everywhere. Um, energy sources, you can get those through a lot of different means. The tricky one is the liquid water. So that's really where we've narrowed our search, is looking for places where there's liquid water. And we start looking at Mars. And we look at a, an impact crater like this. And this impact crater, if you look at this edge, kind of looks like it went splat into something that was m like mud and then froze that it was a soft surface. It wasn't uh, like it hit a, a, a hard rock. It was soft. And then we start looking, and we see channels that look like this. Now, some people said, well, did it have to be liquid water? Could it have been a glacier that carved this? And we look a little bit closer, and we look at the bottom of that riverbed, and we see things that where there's gouges and streamlines. And if you've ever looked, if you're if you've had the opportunity to fly in an airplane, fly over a river, and if you see an island, you may notice that there's this teardrop shape of sediment that it forms around an island. We see that on this bottom of a dried riverbed in Mars. So we start looking, and, and we're intrigued. We see all these things from space, and we say, eh, let's take a closer look. So we develop instruments to go down onto the surface. And the Curiosity rover is the most recent 
roving instrument. There is one called Insight that's landed since then. And coming up in 2020, there's a rover that's similar to Curiosity, built on a similar kind of platform with different science instruments that's going to be going to Mars. So about every two years, we're sending instruments to Mars. Um, the primary goal of Curiosity is to determine, is or was Mars habitable? Was it once habitable? Now, we're not looking for little green men. We're not looking for living organisms. We're looking to see, are the, or was the conditions right for life to exist? Are they the right chemicals? Is there an energy source? It is or was there liquid water? So that's what we're looking for. So we set down this rover. It's about so big. It's me standing next to the life-size model in JPL, uh, Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena, California. And that's where the instrument was put together. It was then shipped over to Florida, and it was launched at uh, Cape Canaveral Kennedy Space Center down in Florida, and then took its uh, nine-month journey to Mars. So this is the Mars rover family portrait, the different rovers that we've put. Sojourner was our very first rover that we put on Mars in 1997. It's about the size of a shoebox. It had one scientific instrument on board, a little thing that took x-rays of the rocks and tried to determine their composition. It was very simple. It was more of a proof of concept of could we put something on Mars. Spirit and Opportunity were these two rovers. They were like the little engines that could. I mean, they just kept going and going and going. They, we launched them. Uh, they got to Mars 2004. They were designed to last three months. They lasted over, I think, one of them 13 years and the other 15. Uh, just a tremendously long time. We've now lost both of them. Um, they're a little bit bigger. They're kind of like a good-sized microwave oven sort of size. And then the Curiosity rover is like a golf cart or a Mini Cooper. Uh, much bigger, much more scientifically sophisticated. Um, it has 17 different cameras. It's got 10 different science instruments. It's got a drill. It's got a laser. It's got all kinds of things. The laser is really cool. You can shoot it at a rock. And you can, it vaporizes the rock, and then it looks at the light that comes off when this vaporizes and determines what the rock is made out of. So without ever going up and reaching and touching it, you can just vaporize it. It's pretty cool. Um, the instrument that I worked on that Jen <coughs> described is SAM, uh, for sample analysis at Mars. Um, it can measure, it's a chemistry instrument, basically. It'll measure the chemical composition of gases. So Curiosity rover landed in August of 2012, and we landed right here in the Martian tropics, right just south of the equator. Um, it wasn't an accident that we landed there. Um, we intentionally picked out this spot. We picked out this spot called Gale Crater. We've named Gale Crater. It's 95 miles across. And in the middle of Gale Crater is an 18,000-foot-high mountain. So it's a pretty good-sized peak. Um, and the amazing thing about the engineers that directed this instrument is that they could say, well, not only are we going to hit Mars, we're going to hit it right here, and we're going to hit it somewhere within this ellipse. That was the, the accuracy that they could predict where they were going to put this instrument down. And we landed right there in the dot, right in the center. And the reason, I mean, there's this whole big group of scientists who decided where you're going to put the rover. And we picked it, uh, Gale Crater, uh, particularly to look for signs of life, or the water. Now, this is not on Mars. <laughs> this is the Badlands of North Dakota. And I show you this because this is an exposed rock face. And when you get this exposed rock face, these are sedimentary rocks. These are rocks that have been laid down over time, more layers getting on top of more layers. And you can look and see this pattern. There's like this bright white, then a medium gray, a dark gray, and then a, a, a medium gray again. You see that same pattern kind of coming across. You could, 
see the, the same dark reddish stripe here and over there. So the sedimentary rock, the deeper you go in the rock layer, the further back in time you're going. So if you can see an exposed rock layer, this part's older because this other part on top of it came afterwards. So if we have this exposed rock layer, the oldest rocks are on the bottom, we can go and analyze those rocks and that'll tell us what, in this case, that part of North Dakota was like when that rock layer was put down. So it gives us a, a kind of a way to look back in time. So we look at these kind of surfaces here on Earth and we find the side of this mountain in, uh, in Gale Crater has this exposed rock layer very similar to what we see. So that was one of the reasons that we wanted to go there is we wanted to know what was Mars like in the past. We had all this evidence from the orbiting spacecraft that Mars seems to have been wet in the past. So let's go and see if the rocks will tell us something. Just to give you an idea for size and scale, this is the side of Mount Sharp and kind of the foothills. Inside this box right here, there's a boulder. That's about the size of the Curiosity rover, which is about that big. So you can maybe imagine what it's like driving through these foothills. Um, she, they're, they're big hills for the rover to get around. I've got some nice pictures that she's taken uh, lately. So we pick this landing site right here. Not only is this rock layer interesting, but you see right up here, kind of looks like a river coming in. And if there ever was liquid water on Mars, it would have been flowing down and it would have pooled up down here on the bottom. In fact, you can even see at the bottom of that river, there's kind of this fan. It's an alluvial fan. It's material that's washed downstream. So we, we look at this and say, if we're looking to see if there was water on Mars, this is a really good place to go. We've got a way to look at how it is in the past and some pretty strong indication that there was something flowing into this crater. So we land down uh, in Gale Crater. This is the very first picture that the rover sent back to us. And I think it's just really cool because you see the shadow. I say it's foreshadowing, looking for the uh, Mount Sharp. And that's where we're looking to explore, that mountain in the middle. But we didn't go straight to the mountain. We took a little detour. As we landed here, um, we named things, and you can probably guess where Bradbury Landing and what that was named after. Um, yes, it was Ray Bradbury in the Martian Chronicles. That's, that's what we named it. Um, we looked from the orbiting spacecraft, and we could see that just nearby, there was this area where three distinct geological features came together. And we said, well, hey, if we take a little detour, we could explore these three terrains with one quick stop. So instead of going over to the mountain this way, we went the other direction. And it took us about 50 days to get to this spot. And then we spent a fair bit of time exploring down um, in this area that we call Glen Elg. On the way to Glen Elg, when we were driving through, we came across this rock. Now, if you look at it, it might look like a piece of concrete jackhammered up when they were doing some road construction or something like that. Um, it's a kind of rock called a conglomerate. And conglomerate rocks are pieces of other rock cemented together. And they can be cemented together by either wind or water. And as we look at this one, we know this one was cemented together by water because it's got pieces in it that are so big, there's no way they could have been carried by the wind. They would have been carried by water. And this was fast moving water. This rock here was in the bottom of a riverbed. So by seeing this rock as we drove by, it gives us a little clue. There was some fast moving water here. So we drove on and we got down into this area of Glen Elg and we see rocks with these white veins in them. 
And those white veins give us another clue that there was water here in the past. We look on Earth and we find a similar rock. And these white, this is a, a rock here on Earth. The white veins have calcium sulfate in them. And the calcium sulfate is left behind when water flows and then it evaporates and it leaves behind this mineral. We go to Mars, we look at this rock here and a close-up of it and we take our instruments and we look at that vein and it's calcium sulfate, giving us another clue, stronger evidence yet that there was water. Then we look and we find these little tiny perfectly round spheres of iron. And those perfectly round spheres of iron form in water. When these little things are called, we call them blueberries. They're not actually organic fruit, but they're re really hard rocks of iron, the little hematite balls. And these perfectly round spheres tell us again, yeah, pretty good chance there was water here. So we find all these things real interesting. We get out some of our tools. This well-equipped rover has on it a little brush. And it's got this steel wool brush kind of thing up here in the corner. You can see it. We get it out and we scratch the surface. And what we immediately notice is different from other things that we've seen on Mars, it's not red. It's the red planet, right, with all the iron oxide and it's rusting, basically, is what makes Mars red. But we sweep it off. And we find it's kind of a gray-green. And if you look, this brush has scratched the rock. It's a really soft rock if a brush is able to make little scratch marks in it. So we decide to get out more of our tools. And this, on the end of the arm, this thing right here is a drill bit. There's little stanchions on the side so that you don't smash the drill too far into the surface, a little protector. Uh, but we got out our drill bit, and we decided to drill in this area. This is our drill site, our first drill site. And if you look at it, to me, it looks a lot like a mud flat after a flood or something. And the dried surface gets this way. I used to live in the Red River Valley, and that river flooded all the time. And this is what my backyard looked like a lot. Um, you, you get these kind of ripples there. And there's interesting things like, that's a hole. I don't know where that hole goes to. Maybe some rabbit made it. No, there, there aren't rabbits there. <laughs> we get the drill out. We make a little test hole just to see. It's the first time we're using this. We make a little test hole. Everything went well. Make another little hole over here. That gets us our full depth. And the full depth of this thing gets down about six centimeters. We programmed it. And the way that we communicate with the rover it's 45 minutes, uh, it varies with the distance between Earth and Mars, but it's about 45 minutes to get a signal to Mars. And so you can't just drive at real time and program things in. You, I mean, you have to very carefully plan your experiments and everything that could go wrong, send those commands, hope that the thing is smart enough to do what you tell it to do, and then at the end, it sends back all the data that it took and then we get to analyze it, and the next day you make plans based on everything that you just measured. So we planned for this thing. We didn't know how this drill was gonna operate. We planned maximum of two hours drill time just to get through this rock. It took seven minutes. It's really soft. It's a really soft rock, and you see it's got this greenish gray look to it, and down in the hole you see these veins, this calcium sulfate vein permeates through the rock, and you see these little dots right here? We went and took that laser, and we basically went down the hole, vaporizing the rock to see what it was made out of. And then we went and scooped, there's a little scoop shovel on the, on the rover, scooped up the drill tailings, and we're gonna analyze what they're made out of. So the instrument SAM is able to do this as well as uh, another mineralogy measurement. You don't wanna dump the sand right into your opening because if you get a really big rock, it might plug the opening and then for the rest of your time on Mars, you're gonna measure the composition of just that one big rock that's stuck. So we have a screen over the top and 
If you ever, when you were a small child, played in the sandbox, you got the little sifter sieve thing, you know what I'm talking about, don't you? You take that, you put the sand in, you shake it back and forth, the little rocks fall through and the big rocks stay up on top. We got one of those on the rover. We only want the little small grains to go into our instruments so that they don't plug our holes. So we've got this 150 microns. A micron is a millionth uh, of a uh, meter, so a thousandth of a, a millimeter. So these little tiny uh, holes here. So little tiny rocks get through. And if you see these little flaps opening here, there's two orifices that, dump, that we can dump the sand into. And this was us just testing, opening the, uh, the arms to make sure they worked. So we open it up, dump the sand in, and look and see. And one of the things that we see is this pattern, you got to trust me on this, the, the folks who designed the mineralogy instrument tell us that when you see lots of stuff right here, it indicates it's phyllosilicate. What's phyllosilicate? It's a clay. It's a clay that's formed in fresh water. Other places on Mars with the spirit and opportunity had discovered water, but it was more like battery acid, really high in pH. We're finding fresh water. Where are you going to find life? life here on Earth, a lot of fresh water is where it's most likely going to be. So we're finding, all of a sudden, we're, we're four months into the mission and we find the right chemicals, the energy source. We got liquid water in the past. We can, we can already say, you know, mission accomplished. We discovered that in the past, Mars was once habitable. There was liquid water. And this Gale Crater was an ancient lake. It was an ancient lake filled with fresh water. And we now know as we've been exploring that it's gotten wet and dry over periods of time as, as water has kind of come and gone off the surface. So we left Glen Elg, we turned, we started traveling, 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 and 2,565 days later, this is where we're at on the side of Mount Sharp. We were up over here. We wanted to get to Mount Sharp. We couldn't just take a quick trip across because that really dark stuff there, those are sand dunes. And those are really tall sand dunes. We didn't want the rover to get stuck. We couldn't climb those kinds of sand dunes. I mean, some of them 30, 40 feet tall. So we had to go and kind of navigate a path through the sand dunes where we could make it up to the side of the mountain. It was really interesting, this first year when I was, uh, in 2012, 2013, I was on sabbatical and I had a chance to go and work with the instrument for that whole year. And we did our thing at Glen Elg and then we're turning and we said, okay, we need to get to Mount Sharp. And it was a whole debate amongst the scientists, how many times do we stop along the way? It's kind of like if you're driving from here to California, you could get in the car and you could go and you could just get there in a short period of time but you might miss seeing some interesting things along the way. On the other hand, if you stop at every historical marker and every little museum along the way, you're never going to get to California. So we had to decide as a group, how many times would we stop and what, how would we decide how to stop? So all these little dots along here, there's places where we found something interesting and took a little detour, but then we'd drive. Um, on a good day, this thing will do about 100 yards. That's how far we can drive in one day. Uh, so it doesn't really go all that fast. We've gone about 13 miles in seven years. I, there was a big celebration when we hit the half marathon. Yeah. <laughs> um, we take some selfies. At the end of the arm, there is a camera that we can turn and we can take a little selfie there. Um, this is a composition of a whole bunch of other pictures and the arm itself is not included. Uh, but you see Mount Sharp back here. And here we were scooping up the sand with our little scoop shovel. We were just right at the edge of a little sand pile. As we're driving down to Mount Sharp, we had to try and navigate. And we'd pick a path that seemed to be not too rocky but not too sandy. And we came across things like this sand dune that was right where we were trying to go. And we knew from Spirit and Opportunity, those other two rovers, one of them got stuck for an extended period of time in a sand trap, basically. 
um, and the engineers really did some interesting maneuvering and eventually got it out, but it was several months that it was stuck in this one spot. We didn't want that to happen with our rover. So we very cautiously, the engineers kind of analyzed how deep they thought it was, how soft it was. We said, okay, let's give it a try. And we turned around and looked back and yep, those are our tracks. We made it through. We sunk down a little bit. Um, there are times where you can see our tracks and all of a sudden they start sinking deeper and deeper and deeper and we say, nope, time to turn around and head out because we didn't want to get stuck. This sand here, we're trying to pick a path that seems fairly smooth but not too deep a sand. The reason we want a fairly smooth path is because the rocks were poking holes in our wheels. And we had this damage here, so we didn't want our wheels to totally shred up. So we were trying to pick paths where there wasn't big, sharp rocks, but not too much sand. And this is some of the sand dunes right along the edge of Mount Sharp that we were trying to get around. We stopped, took a little picture, um, scooped up some sand, analyzed the chemis chemicals of it. Uh, here's one that we drove past. This one's about 14 feet high and there's all kinds of shapes to this. The, there are winds on Mars. It's very, very thin atmosphere. The atmosphere of Mars is about 1 one hundredth the pressure of the Earth's atmosphere. But there are winds that pick up the, the sand and blow them around. And so you get these beautiful little ripples in the sand um, in sizes that we don't see here on Earth which may have a combination of the lower gravity as well as the type of wind that you get on Mars. As we've been going up towards the, the foothills of Mount Sharp and climbing up the side, we see more of these rocks with veins in them. And here's, I think, a really fun picture. There's the veins in the rock, but this thing right there is a meteorite. Just like rocks from space fall and hit the Earth, they do the same thing on Mars. And we know this is a meteorite. Meteorites get really shiny, and they sometimes get little holes in them because as they go through the atmosphere, they heat up. That causes the outside to melt and get really smooth. And then any kind of rock that, that it's made of that can vaporize basically boils off and leaves these little pockmark holes to it. So we see little meteorites down on the surface of Mars as well. Um, this is just a collection of pictures. I think Mars has given us so many beautiful pictures. The, uh, the side of Mount Sharp here has these big mountains. We've got a close-up of, of some of these sedimentary rocks. And uh, you can see there's a lot of geological activity going on as these rocks are formed. And this layer there, again, tells us it's a sedimentary rock formed either by wind or water. So what's the weather like on Mars? Well, it's a little bit colder and a little more variable than here. This is Los Angeles. Daytime high, nighttime low, kind of somewhere between about 80 and maybe gets down into the 60s, 70s. If you go to Mars, um, it, it might get above zero Fahrenheit, maybe as high as 10 degrees, but it gets really cold at night, 100, 120 below zero. Uh, the reason this is, is that thin atmosphere. Our atmosphere is like a nice blanket that keeps the heat in. So when you go to bed at night and you're cold, you put the blanket on. If you're cold, you put a little more blanket on. Mars has just this very thin sheet, and so it gets cold at night. All the heat radiates away. Uh, so I'll tell you a little bit about Sam. Sam, I think, is the... Uh, well, I think it's the best instrument on the rover. Um, if you anthropomorphize the rover, um, we got our, our, oopsie, what did that do? Wrong button. Where am I? Here we are. Try not to touch that button, whatever I did. All right, so the rover, it has wheels, like our legs, to move. It's got cameras, like its eyes. And if we do that, it's got a scoop shovel, and like hands, 
But Sam is the nose. Sam sniffs and tries to figure out what's there. You know, like if you make some soup and you're trying to smell it and see what's in that, if something is hot, it's going to be easier to smell and figure out what's there. So that's what Sam does. It basically can sniff the air, or it can take rocks, heat them up, and smell the gas that's coming off. This is what Sam looks like. Uh, it's about the size of a, a good-sized microwave oven. Um, the little ports where the sand comes in are these two things here, and there is something like a third of a mile of wiring all wrapped around. Um, kudos to the engineers that designed and put this thing together with it being robust and sturdy and lightweight and very, very capable. Uh, it's a good instrument. So what Sam has discovered, this is the top 10 discoveries. You can't see them, so I'll tell you, we discovered organics on Mars. You know those right chemicals? Not only did we discover that there was carbon and hydrogen and oxygen, but they were combined in such a way they made organic molecules. We discovered um, in some of these samples, this was the first drill site that I showed you. We got, the next drill site we had, we went to this place called Cumberland, looked at the drill tailings, and there was a whole lot of something called chlorobenzene which is a type of organic molecule, um, something like what might be in a dry cleaning chemical. And we discovered that it's not in every sample, it's just in some rocks. So we've, we've found that. Um, we've discovered methane on the surface. Now there was some remote sensing that indicated there was some methane perhaps in the atmosphere, but it would come and go. What we've been able to measure by sitting on the surface for nearly three Martian years, a Mars year is about uh, twice, two Earth years equals one Mars year. Mars does one lap around the sun in the time that the Earth does two, because it's further away from the sun. So we've been there just about three years, a little over three years now, and you see this kind of seasonal variation to the methane. And then all of a sudden we'll get some strange things like this that don't really fall within the season. And just this last month, we got a measurement that everyone went, huh? Because this is, the scale here is 0.2 parts per billion. Okay, so for every one little molecule of air, 0.2, for every billion molecules of air, 0.2 of those would be methane. So we're really, really trace amounts. We detected 21 parts per billion of methane. It would be off the scale somewhere up here, and then it was gone. A week later, nothing. So methane here on Earth, most of the methane that we have here on Earth is from organic things. It's the bovines, it's the, um, decomposing organic material will give off methane. But there are geological processes that can also give off methane. So we don't know what's causing these sudden plumes or increases in the atmosphere content of methane, but they come and go. Um, do I think there's something alive that's suddenly, you know, belching out methane? Probably not. It's probably something geological, but I might be a pessimist. But it's hard to believe that there's anything alive on Mars right now because it's so inhospitable. Um, the surface, we don't really expect to find complex organic molecules right on the surface because that very thin atmosphere doesn't block the cosmic radiation. And if you have a complex molecule, an uh, organic thing, the radiation coming from outer space will just make it fall apart. And over the millions of years that the surface has been exposed, any molecules that would have been there are probably broken up into lots of little, simpler organic molecules. Um, so finding you know, DNA or something like that, really complex molecule, we don't expect to find that at all. Um, the reason that we drill is that the rocks protect the molecules and can preserve them. 
because the rocks can stop some of that cosmic radiation. Here on Earth, we get the cosmic radiation stopped by our atmosphere. If you fly up in an airplane, you're going to be exposed to more radiation. Our astronauts that are up on the space shuttle, they actually have to take shelters occasionally if there's a big cosmic storm and the radiation is coming by. They need to be protected. So, um, so methane is interesting. We don't know where it's coming from. It, we make measurements and we see this cyclical change with the seasons. Um, but then there's the occasional mystery that Mars gives us. So we found methane, we found organics, we found that there was fresh water, and I hopefully I convinced you that there was fresh water about three billion years ago. There isn't fresh water on the surface of Mars today, and there wouldn't be. It wouldn't last. If you went to Mars and you put a glass of water on the surface, it would immediately boil. Now, how does it boil? Isn't it like 20 below zero? But the pressure is so low that it would immediately turn into a vapor, no matter the fact that the temperature, boiling is, on Earth we think about boiling as has to be something hot, but it's, it's when it turns into a vapor, well with that very, very low pressure on the surface of Mars, liquid water immediately boils away. So we don't really expect to find any pools and ponds sitting on the surface of Mars right now, because it all boil away. But what this tells us is some time ago in the past, Mars had a more substantial atmosphere because it needed to have that in order to be warm and wet, to keep the planet warm and to keep the water on the surface, to have that atmospheric pressure. So we find out that there's fresh water. We're also, Sam has been able to determine the age of the rocks. There's some really cool experiments we can do. We can look at krypton and xenon, some of these noble gases that don't react with anything, and we can determine how old the rock is based on the composition of it and how cosmic radiation would change the, uh, the composition of the rock. And so we can determine that this area that we're driving in the rocks were formed about four billion years ago, and the ones that are right on the surface have been exposed for about 70 million years. Sounds like a long time, but on Mars time, it's pretty short. Um, we've been able to de determine how the atmosphere of Mars was lost. The SAM instrument has been able to tell that yes, indeed, Mars once had water on the surface, therefore a more substantial atmosphere, but Mars lost its atmosphere. How did it lose it? Well, there was some idea as well, is it chemically combined into the soil or did it go off into space? And we were able to determine with Sam that it went off into space because we looked at some non-reactive chemicals. The things, if you remember your chemistry, way on the edge, the periodic table, it's helium, argon, xenon, krypton, these noble gases that don't react with anything. They don't react with anything, so they're a really good tracer. And we can look and see, and we looked at argon. And there's, argon comes in different isotopes, different sizes, basically, of, of argon. And the heavy stuff is more concentrated than what we expect, which tells us the light stuff went away into space. So that's telling us that Mars lost its atmosphere to space over time, over this three billion years, because the heavier non-reactive gases are there in more abundance than what we find elsewhere in the solar system. Um, we find within the rocks lots of chlorine and lots of sulfur. There's some interesting chemistry that goes on with that. Um, the sulfur kind of helps to preserve the, the rock, kind of like the sulfur in your tires would do. Kind of helps to make it uh, robust. We also find that there's n fixed nitrogen. So the air that we're breathing right now is 78% nitrogen, 21% oxygen. You got lots of nitrogen. But the plants can't use that nitrogen. It, they have to use what we call fixed nitrogen. So it's like ammonia. Ammonia, if you, 
if you know any farmers or ever were, anhydrous ammonia is something they put on the fields. Well, that's fixed nitrogen. It's the type of nitrogen that plants can use. We find that on Mars in the rocks, which is kind of cool. Um, we also are measuring the variability of the Martian atmosphere, and we see the abundance, so the composition of the Mars atmosphere, 95% carbon dioxide, little over 2% argon, and a little less than 2% nitrogen, and little traces of other things like water and methane and oxygen, little traces of that. It's mostly carbon dioxide. Mars has two caps, ice caps, on the poles. They're not frozen water. They're frozen carbon dioxide. It's dry ice. When it's summertime, and Mars, let me back up, Mars has an axis that's tilted about 24 degrees, similar to our Earth has a tilted axis, which means that there's seasons on Mars. So when it's summertime, the ice melts off the pole. It vaporizes, actually. The dry ice basically sublimes, goes into the atmosphere, and it condenses on the South Pole. And then when the South Pole experiences summer, that warms up, and it goes back up to the North Pole. So we see this seasonal change of how much carbon dioxide is in the atmosphere as it's basically going from the South Pole to the North Pole. Our poles change like that, too. We're just about ready for the polar cap to move down to about our area. And if you looked at the Earth from space, you'll start seeing the white moving further and further down the planet. And then in the South Pole, it's thawing, and they're getting their springtime. So we were looking at this variability, and we can explain the variability of the Martian atmosphere and how the composition changes, except oxygen has given us a puzzle. So we can answer some questions, but we also get more puzzles, more things that make us curious. Where is this? The oxygen's changing at a different rate, and we don't know why. Keeps us going back. The other thing that we've discovered is that Mars was wet for a longer period of time than what we thought. This lake was wet <coughs> and then dried out, came back, wet, dry, wet, dry. Went through all these cycles of wet and dry. And it was wet for a long, long time. So thinking about if or was Mars ever once, was there anything alive ever once on Mars? If we look at the biological record here on Earth, life arose pretty quickly after things calmed down and the Earth kind of stopped getting bombarded by all this debris from space and the rocks solidified. And fairly soon after, life arose. We see some evidence of early life, very simple, single-celled organisms. It took a long time for us to get to complex, multicellular things like us. But for the longest time in the Earth's history, from about three and a half billion years ago, there's been life on Earth. Go look at Mars. Three and a half billion years ago, looked a lot like Earth. It was wet. There was fresh water. Were the conditions right long enough for chemistry to turn into biology? for those chemicals to get together and make a cell. Well, the fact that it was wet for a long period of time increases the odds a little bit there in our favor. And we also found, from looking at the sulfur and the different types of sulfur, the different isotopes of sulfur, that there was some kind of hydrothermal system. You know, Early on, I talked about those hydrothermal vents in the deep bottom of our ocean that provide energy to the the little tube worms that come up in the ocean, that's how they get their energy source. Well, we find a similar kind of thing on Mars. We got evidence that long ago in the past, there was a hydrothermal system. There was energy coming from the inside with warm water. So that's kind of cool. There's a lot of evidence that the conditions were right for life to have arisen. Did it? We don't know. That's why we're sending more complex instruments to help try and discover and understand. So we're exploring this area right here on the side of the mountain. 
We got this little rocky formation. We've got some clay. The clay is interesting because that's the wet stuff, the stuff that formed when it was wet. Then we've got some places where we look from space and we see there's lots of sulfur there. We'll go taste that and see what that's like. Um, but I think they're just kind of pretty pictures. This is where we've proposed, oops, go away. Um, we proposed to travel this white line. This is the high rise image and then it changes to kind of show the different chemical composition of the surface. So this is what we see from space and then we can use different instruments to determine, well, there's some clay over here, there's some sulfur over here, but the white line is if everything keeps going well with the rover, that's the path we're gonna take. So we kind of set a, charted our course and we're gonna try and get up into here and see. We're right now right about here and we're gonna get up into this clay bearing region. That's one of my favorite pictures the rover gave. I got it show you this beautiful picture. This is the surface of Mars, the foothills of Mount Sharp where this exposed rock face is. This is where we're looking to see what is Mars like now and what was it like three billion years ago. Because we know this is Mars today. It's cold, it's dry, it's very inhospitable. But three and a half billion years ago, it maybe looked like this a place that we know life is abundant. And so that's why we keep going back to Mars. Thank you. You can follow along if you want more. So we got some time for questions if you want. Yes. We're kind of getting some estimates maybe in the, in the kind of half a billion year kind of uh, period. Okay. So relatively brief in relation. In relation, yeah. It's been dry for a while. Yeah. Um, but yet we see some really interesting things from space. There seems to be some places like there might be some water reservoirs under the surface. And there's some rocks where you might see water coming out. It, it doesn't last very long, but it seems to be that it, there's some kind of water coming out from under the surface in occasional spots. So there might be some aquifers. So if that's going on, if there's a heat source and you got that liquid water, well, okay, let's drill down and see what's, what's swimming around in there. That's the fun stuff. The next rover, Mars 2020, will be specifically looking for organic molecules because we found the water, now they're gonna be looking for more um, of those organic molecules, and that's the quest with that one. All focused on getting the question of is or was there life? Yeah. Do you find uh, any traditional elements? No, the periodic table is pretty much, it's the periodic table everywhere in the universe because as you go from one element to the next, you're just adding one more proton and you can't really add a part of a proton. So they come in increment steps. And then the more radioactive things further down, if there would be any new elements, those would most likely be very short lived if there was anything. Um, so no, we haven't discovered any new elements. What we've found is how they're put together to make the molecules. Oh, so it's a little bit of both. There's, there's some batteries and it gets its energy not from solar panels. Other rovers use solar panels, but this one has a radioactive source in it and the heat coming from this radioactive decay generates electricity. The nice thing is that makes it able to run day and night. But there's only so much energy and then you gotta, we literally say the rover needs to take a nap, we're gonna put it to sleep, we'll wake it up. I mean, we really anthropomorphize this thing. <laughs> they play music to wake it up. Um, it's more for the engineers to wake up, I think. But 
Um, it wake up the rover, but it has to rest and basically recharge the battery. So why we can only go, you know, 50 or 100 yards is we have to program everything. So you can either drive it one of two ways. You can make it smart drive where it's got to look and see, okay, I'm running into a chair, now I got to turn, and now I hit another chair, and now I hit another chair. And, you know, so you kind of have to make it self-program and that takes a long time. Or one of the things that we can do is we take pictures with a camera the day before, we look out and we say, okay, there's a straight path right through here Let's program it to go right through here. And then there's some safety features, like if it there happens to take a turn or get a big rock and you don't want it to tip over and that sort of thing. But you have to program it and with caution and care because you don't want it to get stuck. So it's a combination of do you want it to be smart and do it itself? That's going to take a long time to do that computer processing. Or the fastest is when we program it and say, go that way in a straight line and you know do eight wheel turns to get to this spot and then 10 wheel turns to get to that and then turn. So that's kind of how we program it. Part of it is there's just not a lot of power. And when the SAM instrument runs, it's really energy intensive and everything else basically goes to sleep. SAM does its thing and then the rover rests and then it comes back with full batteries. So. It's slow moving, and it's not like we can control it from here, and, and you know, it's not like the video games with the joystick to, to drive it around. Other questions? Yeah. Ah, very good. So we can launch something to Mars once every two years. I mentioned that Earth goes around twice when Mars goes around once. So every two years we're on the same side of the sun, and then a year later we're on the opposite side, and then a year later, I practiced that a while. <laughs> we're back together. So every two years you can get something. You want to take it, you can't go through the sun when you're on the opposite side. So that's why every two years we've got Mars, you know, in 2012, 2014, 2016, 2018. Th those are our launch windows. So we launch it from Kennedy Space Center, takes about eight months to get there. And it's all programmed, free flying. Just once you launch something to, into space, once you get beyond the pull of Earth's gravity, the object in motion stays in motion and there's no outside forces. So you don't have to have an engine going to keep it going to Mars. It just, you point it and it goes. And then you gotta slow it down to get the right speed to land on the surface. If you're going too fast, you skip off the top of the atmosphere and you miss the planet. And if you're going too slow, you, gravity will pull you in and you'll crash. So you, it's a lot of careful engineering and math and calculations to get at just the right speed to carefully land. This thing did the most fantastically amazing engineering feat of how it landed because it took seven minutes to go from the top of the atmosphere to the surface and it was all pre-programmed it started with a heat shield that slowed it down and then that jettisoned and there was a parachute because parachutes only work when there's air so you couldn't use those way high. So you had to slow down and get deep enough where there was enough air to inflate a parachute. That slowed it down but there's not enough atmosphere to really slow it down so you couldn't use that completely. So then they had to jettison the parachute and they had to fire retro rockets down so you're pushing a rocket down basically to, to slow it so it came down. But we didn't want all that fuel and everything and all the debris coming back up onto the spacecraft. So it hovered up there and dropped the rover down on a tether and landed it gently going two miles an hour onto the surface. So it was going you know, 23,000 miles an hour at the top of the atmosphere and landed two miles an hour gently placed on the surface, exactly where we wanted it. And all of that happened in seven minutes, and it was about 14 minutes later that we got a message that said, yeah, it, we're here, but you kind of hoped and prayed 
that everything you programmed and every variable, the thickness of the atmosphere, everything, you know, if there was a wind at that time, everything had to be accounted for and you really hoped you got it right and it worked beautifully. So. <laughs> It depends on if you're on this side or that side of the sun. That's why I say it varies to get a message there and back. You know, it's, it, it varies in the time that it takes to get there. Yeah. Mm, good question. Um, Earth communicates directly with the rover. We send a signal to the rover and we say, here's your job for today. These are the things we want you to do. It does its thing, and then it communicates back to us. But I liken the rover to a weak outfielder. A weak outfielder can't throw the ball all the way from left field to home plate. So what does a weak outfielder do? Hits the shortstop. We have satellites going around Mars, and the rover will send its signal up to the satellite. That has a strong enough antenna to send it home. So that's how we, we communicate with it. And we have to wait for the satellites going around Mars to relay the, to, first they gotta fly over the crater. And you're in this crater, so it's like being in a mountain here. You don't have a full view of the sky. You wait till the, the satellite comes over and it's only there for a little time. And then it heads off. And once it gets the data, then it transmits it back to Earth. And it comes, to us over the deep space network. And if you really want, you can go to those websites, you can go to the deep space network and you can see what satellites and what uh, uh, spacecraft are being received at those different times. Um, yeah, it's, that's how it communicates. It's not a fast process, but it works. And we've got three different satellites orbiting Mars that can be a relay station for us. I did in the past. I haven't been able to so much. My new job here keeps me a little busy. I do miss it though at times. There is, there's an intensity that is incredible um, and exhausting at times and stressful, but there's also the adrenaline of, I, I can remember the very first day we landed on Mars, I was in JP, at um, Goddard Space Flight Center just outside of Washington, D.C. And we were waiting for the data and we were waiting to turn on the instrument. Did this thing survive landing? So one of the first things they did, slowly turn on each of the instruments. And we turned on our instrument, and this is just kind of this surreal moment of technology. I'm in the north woods of Minnesota camping in a tent on my cell phone and my computer, and I'm getting the data from Mars, talking to all, the science team had a conference call as we were talking about the data and what we were seeing right away, and I'm in the woods camping, <laughs> and I was able to do this. It was, uh, like I say, kind of a surreal technology moment to be there, and it's like, that's Mars. And I'm talking with it. So, it's. Don't get to do that so much anymore. Sure. <laughs> Other questions? Well, thank you all. I'll be around. I think there's refreshments. lovely refreshments out there. So thank you very much for your attention and have a good evening. <laughs>